this particular study uh, was looking at embryo quality. So cows were super ovulated and looking at embryos. That group, that, that lower 25% that really lost body condition uh, or body weight in this particular study had poorer embryo quality. So when you look at uh, percents of grade one and twos as percent of fertilized, if you look at pers- they had a lot more degenerate embryos. So that study really showed there's a relationship for these cows that lose a lot of body weight post-calving. There's a relationship between poor embryo quality, which might explain the differences in fertility. Hello, this is Mark Thomas here and welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show today. Uh, It's a pleasure to have Dr. Paul Fricke, a repeat guest with us uh, here on the Dairy Podcast Show. Uh, Dr. Fricke is a professor of dairy science at uh, Wisconsin and his area of expertise uh, amongst uh, many different aspects of dairy cattle uh, is the focus on reproduction. So. it's uh, again a pleasure to have you here, Paul, uh, this morning. Great. It's great to be back, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. Always appreciate it. You're welcome. It. So uh, as usual, I think it's easiest. You know yourself the best, uh, or, or maybe your spouse does, but uh, if you could uh, give a brief uh, introduction to the audience for uh, those who sure. perhaps haven't listened to your previous podcast and a uh, little background about what you do in your, your research, and then we'll, we'll move right into uh, some great discussion. Great. Yeah, I'll start at the beginning. I grew up on a dairy farm in eastern Nebraska. I uh, grew up on a farm where uh, my dad farmed with my grandfather and my uncle. We milked about 60 Holstein cows. That's my. That, those are the credentials that the dairy farmers I talk to worry about the most, Mark, that I've actually milked cows before. Uh, the University of Nebraska uh, got a degree in animal science there, went to North Dakota State University for my master's and PhD, spent some time at the Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. I was broadly trained as a reproductive biologist. I did a lot of basic research with uh, cell proliferation and death and doing a lot of histology and those kinds of things. When I got done with my PhD, I ran into Milo Wiltbank at a, at a meeting and he had a, a postdoc open. He had just gotten a USDA grant, so I applied for that, interviewed at Wisconsin, came here in, I think it was 95, Started a postdoc with Wilt Bank and Ginther. Uh, ended up, you know, being here for about two years on a postdoc. Uh, got an interim position that was mostly extension. So I wasn't thinking about extension too much when I was going through my training. Ended up that I really enjoyed going out, working with dairy farmers, working with veterinarians. Uh, like to get up in front of people and explain stuff, talk about things. Took my then I interviewed for a position here that came open so 1998 so I've been here in my position since 1998 which makes how many years Mark that's about 25 years or so that I've been here at the University of Wisconsin my appointment is between extension and research so I do run a research lab have a few grad students all the time working on various things and um, so that's pretty much it Mark I try to I try to um, I try to work in areas that I see that are, are important, that are going to make a difference out there, and try to keep uh, keep pushing farmers and nutritionists and veterinarians to try to improve things in the dairy industry. Dairy cattle health is constantly threatened by the exposure of mycotoxins in feed. The monitoring of fungal toxins has become indispensable in the feed industry and in animal production. DSM Fermaniche offers a range of analytical services to assess the mycotoxin contamination and solutions to combat mycotoxins. Learn more at dsm.com forward slash ANH dash NA. Well, thanks, Paul. And I think one thing uh, that's really evident from, from you and your group, uh, obviously, you know, some very innovative protocols. Everyone wants to know, uh, you know, what protocol should I use in my herd? And, and obviously, you know, Offsync was uh, was born from from your group in Wisconsin, but also the the practicality, right? Uh, you know, the the research the the that can be really uh, brought to the farm today and uh, applied, not not something that's uh, for the future or, or very theoretical, but, but very practical. So certainly, look forward to that discussion today. Uh, as we caught up a little bit this morning. Uh, you know, what's what's new or what are the continued topics? And, and 
the high fertility cycle is certainly something that uh, really everyone's interested in as we uh, uh, sometimes are challenged in, in herds with uh, that, that thought that we can't have high productive cows, highly productive cows that are healthy and, and have really good reproductive performance. And we know that's not true. Uh, but let's start there as, as we yeah. uh, kind of dig into some of these uh, areas to discuss. Yeah, Mark, this has been what I call a hot topic. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go back uh, kind of where this all started in 1992. Well, I'll start even before that. We've known that body condition score change has affected reproduction for quite a while back in the 70s and 60s. You know, cows, you know, the old story was that cows that lose more than a point. That was the big that was a big thing. So if they lose more than a point po post calving, they're going to have uh, poor reproduction than if they don't. And um, Jack Britt is a pretty famous reproductive biologist. Jack's still out there giving talks. He was at been at several different institutions. When he was at North Carolina State, he um, all he was doing with this small university herd of cows is just body condition scoring these cows weekly for like 10 weeks after calving. And Jack's a good scientist. He started pouring through the data and just started looking at it. And he says, you know, I can, I can put cows into two different groups. There was a group of cows that calved at a higher body condition score and then they lo lost condition over the first three weeks, pretty, pretty dramatically. But, and I think, you know, Mark, I think we've taught dairy science students, animal science students, veterinarians that all cows lose condition post calving. It's just a matter of managing that loss. How much? So that isn't really true. Yeah, if you look at if you look at Jack's data, then there was another group of cows, and it's it's split almost 50-50. There was another group of cows that calved at a lower body condition score, and they didn't lose. And if you put the cows into those two groups based on the first three weeks change and look across ten weeks, you've got these th these two very distinct patterns. You got the group of cows that calved at a higher body condition score, and then they lose for about six weeks and then start to gain that condition back. I think that's what most people think most cows do. But those cows that, that um, there were actually 30 cows in that group. There were 46 cows that maintained. So they just really didn't change. They capped a lower body condition score and, and they didn't change. And when Jack looked at the reproductive performance, just first service conception rate in those two small groups of cows, it was 60, over 60% 60 for the cows that maintained. It was 26% for the cows that lost. So that's a big difference. Small groups of cows, obviously, this was just kind of yeah. a preliminary data. But huge study. differences. But huge differences. And so what Jack wanted to do as a biologist was to explain a, a physiologic scenario that would explain what's happening in these cows that lose. And that's really where we get to the Brit hypothesis. Now, Mark, I don't know if they taught you the Brit hypothesis when you were in vet school, but that's this idea that that it takes multiple estrous cycles to grow an activated primordial follicle up to where it's going to ovulate. So we all think about these follicular waves. Fol the follicular wave that we see with an ultrasound is really only the last seven to ten days of the growth of this follicle. The ovaries are full of these primordial follicles in an arrested state of meiosis and then when these primordial follicles are activated it takes like three to five estrous cycles to grow these things up it's a long period of time and so what jack said okay if we want to breed a cow at 60 days if you just follow back these cows that lose go into this negative energy balance and that follicle is growing through that period of negative energy balance and um so the Brit hypothesis is that something is happening associated with negative energy balance, he didn't say what it was, that is impairing the fertility of the oocytes in, in those follicles at a very early stage development. And um, that's the Brit hypothesis. Um, I think the Brit hypothesis kind of languished for a little while. Uh, we all knew it was out there. It's very, very difficult hypothesis to test in like a randomized controlled trial. Um, and then we came along and, uh, there was a, a group of us at Wisconsin, a number of postdocs, grad students, Milo Wolfbank, my colleague, Rick Grummer. We had done a number of experiments. And so we went back and retrospectively looked, uh, through these old data sets and, and kind of put them together. And this paper that we published, there's three different experiments in it. One of them, 
uh, was a very simple just what what is the relationship between body condition score at breeding and fertility? And that showed that if cows are too thin at breeding, they had lower fertility than cows that weren't too thin. I think it was be below 2.5. So I think we all know that thin cows are, are not a good thing. Essentially what's happening with those thin cows is they stop cycling. So you deal with an anovular, kind of a deep an ovular condition that's really difficult to deal with, even with synchronization protocols, hard to deal with. Um, but the the second experiment in that in in that paper looked at body weight change, and when you look at body weights, if you just weigh cows every week, um, what what we looked at in that study was um, body weight change, and if you it, the most important thing about this analysis, so if you just take means and standard errors, so let's talk about statistics. When we're, when we're trained as scientists, we're trained to look at means and standard errors. That's the way our statistics work. We, we do these things called analysis of variance, and it's based on the variation around a mean. So if you just look at means and standard errors and look at body weight change, it looks like all cows lose and then they gain it back. But what was done in this study was cows were put into quartiles. And so when you do a quartile analysis, so essentially quartiles, the top 25%, the next 25%, the next 25%, and the bottom 25%. When you put them in quartiles, something very different emerges. The top 25% of cows actually gained 2% body weight and then kind of stayed high. And then the next 25% kind of maintained the next 25% kind of lost for six weeks and then came back. And then the next, the lowest 25% really dropped. They lost 7 or 8% of their body weight in the first three weeks. Um, and so a very different picture emerges. And so not all cows lose body condition score. Some maintain uh, and some gain. And uh, this particular study uh, was looking at embryo quality. So cows were super ovulated and looking at embryos. That group, that, that lower 25% that really lost body condition uh, or body weight in this particular study had poorer embryo quality. So when you look at uh, percents of grade one and twos as percent of fertilized, if you look at – they had a lot more degenerate embryos. So that study really showed there's a relationship for these cows that lose a lot of body weight post-calving. There's a relationship between poorer embryo quality, which might explain the differences in fertility. And then uh, the third study in that paper was probably the most striking study. It was, a, it was a study my grad student did. We were doing it for another reason. But what this grad student was doing on two fairly large dairies in Wisconsin was uh, body condition scoring these cows at calving and then body condition scoring them at 21 days. And all cows are submitted to a double off-sync program for first, uh, first breeding. And um, so – what was done retrospectively with this data set is cows were put into lost, maintained, or gained body condition during the first three weeks. Okay. And I think it was, I don't have the numbers right at the top of my head, about 40% of cows lost, 20 or 30% of cows uh, maintained, and the rest of the cows gained. And uh, interestingly, uh, milk production didn't differ in the first 21 days across those groups which to me says that the cows that gained, they're given about the same amount of milk as the cows that lost, those cows had to be eating. They had to be getting their energy from somewhere, right? So they're eating more, which is what we want these lactating cow cows to do. And probably the most striking thing in this data set, if you look at first service conception rate coming off a double obsync program, for the cows that lost, conception rate was 25%. And this is a big study. There's like 1,800 cows in this study. So we're talking... 400 or 500 cows that lost, 25% conception rate at first service. Mark, that's not good, right? Not at all. The cows all. that maintained, yeah, the cows that maintained were around 40%. Mm -hmm. And the cows that gained, 400 and some cows that gained in that study were 80%. 80%. 80% yeah. Which we looked at that data set and it's like you tell the grad student, go back to your cubicle, go back to your desk and make sure this is right. Some, something's wrong. Uh, something's number wrong. Number one, something's wrong with this. We almost we almost were reluctant to publish it because I don't believe eighty percent is repeatable, but that's that's what it was in that data set. And so you've got this stair step, right? You got the 
lost at 25%, the maintained at 40%, the gained at 80%. And when I show this data to farmers, I challenge them. And I say, how much of that difference is due to the protocol? And obviously none of it's due to the protocol. They're all in the same protocol. And what is the one thing that farmers want to do when repro's not good on a dairy? You know, change the protocol. Change the protocol, change the protocol right? Yeah. And so I think I think this was exciting. Now I, I do talk about protocols. Fertility programs are real. Fertility, fertility programs are what gets us into this high fertility cycle. But uh, but there's a, there's a big part of the cows, and whether you know one of these things is this body condition score loss. It's and you know this is just one paper that we've done. We've got other studies that we've looked at. I'm working with a, a, a colleague of mine in Germany. He's got a very large data set from a dairy in, in Slovakia, 20,000 20, uh, observations in this data set. Anytime we look at this, there's a relationship between a negative relationship between body condition score change and fertility. Cows that lose a lot of body condition have much lower fertility than cows uh, that maintain or gain. So I just asked the question, how do we get cows to maintain or, or gain body condition score? And the answer is um, getting your cows pregnant in a timely fashion at the end of the voluntary waiting period. The quicker you can get those cows pregnant, they're in the high fertility cycle because cows that cows that calve at a lower body condition score have less body condition score loss. They they're healthier. They have less uh, health events. They have higher fertility. Uh, they, they tend to, you tend to get them pregnant quickly at the end of the voluntary waiting period. And then Mark, the thing is they don't spend too much time in late lactation. That's really what this is about is cows that fail to get pregnant, spend a lot of time in late lactation at a low milk production state, eating a ration that's balanced for a lot more milk production. And that's where they put on this body condition. And so if you can get your cows cows. pregnant, those are the fat cows. And I think everybody knows this relationship intuitively between uh, you know fat cows and i think you know when i talk to nutrition nutritionists about this nutritionists want to somehow proactively manage uh body condition score that's kind of hard to do i I don't know if you agree with that or not mark i mean just saying we've got fat cows and we're going to feed them somehow differently that that's a that's hard uh because if you if you reduce the energy in the ration they tend to compensate by changing milk production level right? So the best thing you can do is get your cows pregnant. So the message that I'm taking out there is if you get your cows pregnant quickly at the end of the voluntary waiting period, that's a self-correcting mechanism by which you you calve thinner cows. And so what do I mean by thin cows? Uh, around three. Body condition score at three. And so I I tell farmers all the time, you got to change your eyeballs. Some farms, some farmers like to see heavier cows in the transition. Uh, I think we have to adjust our eyes and look at a little bit thinner cows. This runs counter too to the the old recommendations for body condition score. And Mark, you've seen these old charts where the cows calve at between 3.25 and 3.75, and then then they just go down and then they come back up. Okay, that that old chart, I'm trying to go around and destroy all those that exist and say that's not the way the biology works. The way it actually works is that the higher the condition score when they calve, the more they're going to lose. Okay, the thinner those cows get at calving and not too thin, you know, around that three, the flatter they are. They just don't lose. They tend to maintain maintain condition during that period of time. So it's a I think it's a powerful concept. It's an interesting concept. And my challenge to farmers and nutritionists is to get herds into uh, this high fertility cycle. And it, it accounts for, I think, a lot of the improvements in reproduction that we've seen over the last 25 years. No, th- Paul, that, that uh, you know, really hits home as, <clears throat> as we work with uh, producers day to day. You know, one is whenever you're coming upon uh, fat cows, a group of fat cows, or, or perhaps a new client you're working with in the herd, uh, often to surprise of some folks, uh, you know, it's a repro program, and, and you know, some people look yep. a little confused. Like, how, how is how are fat cows a repro program? Well, it, obviously, it, it makes sense. And then <clears throat> I really appreciate your comments about changing changing the eyeballs, right? Because we still get these um, challenges at times of 
uh, you know, an outside uh, uh, consulting group or perhaps a representative from a company, you know, the, the, the solution or the potential issue of something going on on the farm. Repro in many cases are actually thin cows. The cows are too thin. And in most cases, the cows are really in perfect body condition. They're high producing cows. And it's just that we setting the eyes that we don't need these pudgy fat cows freshening in. We need a more athletic animal that's going to yep. just maintain. And uh, I guess it's that paradigm shift that, that we in the industry need to, to really push. And like you said, destroy some of these old charts, right? Trying to work with the nutrition companies to do that. I think some of them have, have done that. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit of practical things. There's, you know, I do research. I'm, I, I live half my life in the ivory tower of academia, but I live the other half of my life out on farms trying to solve some of these problems. And I'll tell you that usually, and you're in these situations as well, Mark, when you're working with a farm that has a problem with repro, you're probably going to be working in a group. You've got the owner, you got the manager, you got the herds people. You might have the nutritionist there. Obviously, you would have the nutritionist there. Might have the breeder there and the veterinarian there. If you bring up body condition score pro issues, you'll you'll disenfranchise the nutritionist because everybody looks to the nutritionist for the solution to the body condition score problem. If you if I go onto a farm and I say, look, I think there's a problem with body condition score in the transition. Immediately, everybody looks to the nutritionist. Well, what are you going to do about this? When you actually hit the nail on the head, it's not a nutrition problem. In fact, I had a nutritionist look at me one time and said, hey, don't look at me. We're getting 100 pounds of milk out of this herd. It's, that's not the issue. The issue is a repro problem. But I just found that it's difficult to have that discussion sometimes because what you're kind of I think that sometimes the nutritionists feel that you're pointing the blame at them, and it's not the problem. It's not the nutritionist problem. It's it's a problem with repro that you have to solve. And so these are these are where these concepts get a little uh, dicey in the real world, right? You have to go out there and you actually have to talk through some of these kinds of things. And I've been on situations, you know, if I go to farm, um, and I suspect it's a high fertility uh, cycle issue, which I think this is probably one of the big issues with repro now today. Um, I want to see the close up dry cows. You know, I want to see, I want to see that pen of cows. And I was standing there on a farm with, with, with that group that I just told you about. And I made them body condition score cows for me. And you know, these cows average, I bet you the average condition of these, these close up dry cows was probably pushing four. four and yeah. here's the deal. Yeah. Here's the deal, Mark. They, they were suffering from what I call normalcy bias. This is what their dry cows have always looked like. They've always like, yes. been for, right? And then I went to the, um, I always want to see the, the post fresh group. Mm -hmm. And man, they're, they're thin. They're, they're down in that 2.5. And again, um, normalcy bias kicks in. I'm making them body condition score those cows. And that's just normal. Cows, you know, what they were telling me. You know, Dr. Fricky, don't you know that all cows lose body condition score? These these cows are working really hard. We've got high milk production. Of course, of course they're thin. Of course they're losing all this body condition. And based on the data that we have, Mark, it's not a, a foregone conclusion that cows have to lose condition. If you calve them in at that lower condition score and they're not too fat and the cow's healthy, Post-calving, what that cow does, she can't mobilize body fat to keep up with the energy. So what does she do? She eats. She's got an appetite. She eats. That's where she gets her energy. And what's better for a postpartum lactating cow than a full, a full rumen, right? That's what we want. We don't, we don't want the empty. We don't want to see feed intake go down. That, that's where you get into the ketosis, the BHBA. That's where you get into the LDA problems. That's where you get into, uh, I think that quartile of cows that I talked about that just lost a lot of body condition, those cows get into this negative, this spiral downwards uh, that's, that kind of drives them into this really, uh, really bad state. So I don't know what you think. I'm sure you see this stuff out there, Mark. Absolutely. And, and metabolically, it makes perfect sense, really. If you, if you, you know, think it through, it's, it's, uh, it's, not thinking outside of the box metabolically, but in terms of the paradigms that, that we've become accustomed to, 
it's thinking outside of the box in terms of what body condition score should be. Um, I think you also made a really good point, make people body condition score. In my experience, I've been led, you know, down the path of just looking at a, a cows in a fresh pen and your eyes, you know, you focus on those few cows that are thin. They are thin, yep. you know, they're lame. They had metritis, ketosis, what have you. And all of a sudden, you know, the perception is, wow, fresh cows are thin. You know, I like to do something as simple as just go in the pen and, 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 and score 50 cows and how many are under two, 275 and, and gee, okay. It's, it's, uh, it's 3%. Okay. I don't think we have a problem. We have, you know, some, some cows we could help, but you know, the bulk of the cows are, are just fine. Um, so <clears throat> I think, you know, like you said, perception is, is really important there. Yeah. Just, to, just to jump on that once real quick. Um, I, I totally agree with you on making people body condition scores. Some of these farms, what I what I'll have them do is uh, I'll have them record body condition scores at calving and at breeding, and you you have to go and record them because because I've I've been in the situation where I've been talking through with a farmer, even a nutritionist, and it's like oh well this isn't a problem here it's not a problem, and I said okay let's go look at the cows. We walked out to the close up dry pen. And there's at least three cows standing there that are four. And I yes. said, what about that cow? What about that cow? And it's like, they finally go, yeah, yeah, they're a little heavy, right? So until, you, can't just, you can't just say, oh, this isn't a problem here. I think you have to go out and collect the data and you have to look at it, record it, and then, and then retrospectively go back and, and look at it and, and see how it's affecting the cows. That's, that's the way you have to, have to deal with it with, with real data on the farm. So, Paul, with um, more technology, uh, body condition scoring, cameras, uh, some other technologies that are coming down the line, any experience there of how you could actually then use that data? And would you perhaps actually, uh, you know, with, with, with more data and, and, and more ability to individualize some treatments or protocols, Obviously, the goal would be to prevent those heavy cows and that body condition score loss. But in those that um, it wasn't prevented, perhaps assigning them to a different protocol, a, a longer voluntary wait period or something of that nature. So yeah, yeah. Any, any, any beginnings of that, of starting to actually use automated data to, to make some uh, decisions. Great question, Mark. I don't have any any experience with those systems. I know you know the cameras that get, that sit above the cow as they, as they leave the parlor. Um, they're working on those systems and and making them better all the time. I think what we're moving towards, though, Mark, is big data. Right? That's what that's where we're moving. Big data. So imagine if you had a body condition score on every cow three times a day. So yes. so that's great, right? But the question is, what do you do with all that data? Correct. What do you I, do? You know, so, yeah. so where where do you get the actionable item, right? And I think at some point we're going to have to have some way to analyze that data, where you could segregate cows into loss, maintained, or gain groups, and then you can look at reproduction in those groups and those kinds of things. You can track that across time. Um, strategies to, you know, I think part of your question is you know what do you do if you have a problem right what do you do if your herd's not in the high fertility cycle that's a tough issue and i think um with nutrition for example you can conceivably go onto a farm and change a diet and see an almost immediate change in milk production right i mean that's that very commonly happens i see it happen all the time everybody wants that to happen with repro you know they want they want someone to come out figure out the problem, get a wrench on that problem, tighten it up and just see things get better. Unfortunately, because of the nature of the binomial outcome, the yes or no, pregnant, not pregnant, it takes a while and takes a lot of data to work through this. And so I tell farms, you know, you're looking at probably a year at least to get cows through that calving period and, and try to adjust that. We can call our way out of it to some extent. Heifers are relatively cheap. Um, I'm challenging farmers, you know, how many times you're going to breed a cow. Um, you know, I mean, we get, and I show an example in our UW herd, uh, we have our repro program set up. We've got a 76 to 82 day voluntary waiting period. 
And within 100 days, we have three breedings into all the cows. They have three chances to get pregnant. You can increase that if you were to do a lot of heat detection between those breedings. So a lot of our farms are doing that sort of thing too. But we get about 90% of our cows pregnant within 100 days of the voluntary waiting period. That's how you keep a herd in the high fertility cycle. Now, the question is, what happens to those cows? You're always going to have cows to get to the fourth breeding or the fifth breeding or the sixth breeding. I think we have to start asking the question, do we want to continue to try to breed those cows? Because a cow that's at her eighth breeding, for example, is not going to be in the high fertility cycle the next time around. And I always use the example, we had one cow in our herd. She was bred eight times. She's on her eighth insemination. Why is she getting an eighth insemination? Well, it's because someone fell in love with that cow. That's why. <laughs> someone fell in love with that cow and they just want to keep trying to get her pregnant which is fine. I always say you can fall in love with some of your cows, but you can't fall in love with all of them, right? But So I think we have to start asking that question. What, How many times are we going to breed a cow? Uh, really, the issue in the dairy industry now, Mark, is we're producing too many heifers. You know, yes. this in the old days, 20 years ago, when we had 14% pregnancy rates, you had to take every heifer born on the, on the farm and you had to get those heifers into the lactating stream just to keep up with the culling rate right? Um, today, that's not the issue. Today, we've got really high preg rates and we can produce more female calves than we need. And so it's not necessary to get every cow in your herd pregnant. There is a certain percentage that are just going to be reproductive failures, even if you're aggressive with the reproductive management program. I guess the other comment that I always make also is it, if, if those cows that you know need are they just statistically unlucky that they need eight services to get pregnant or if they are low fertility cows why do we want to replicate those cows why do we want to reproduce yep. them in the herd you know so that i guess that's the other point of of you know how far do we go to get get her pregnant when she should not she should not uh, uh bring new generations onto the dairy she should be yeah she should leave yeah so yep Yep. And, and I think the argument there would be, I think there's some of both going on there, Mark. I think there are some less fertile cows, obviously, within the area of genomics, just looking at daughter pregnancy rates, some of the things we've seen. There's there's differences in the genetic populations within a herd. But there's also this issue of statistical bad luck, right? I mean, binomial outcome, flip a coin, flip a coin, you know, however many times. I, I do this with rooms full of people, actually. If you have yes. a, a good sized audience, a couple hundred people, I tell them to take a coin out. And I say, all right, so you're my dairy herd. This this coin flip represents a 50% conception rate. So everybody flips their coin, and I said, if you if your heads, uh, you, you get it, you, you're pregnant, and you get to sit down. And um, so you flip the coin. About half the audience sits down, and then then you have the remainder flip a coin. Well, about another half, half. will sit down, <laughs> and another half sit down. And so there's what 25% of the people or so that are standing up. If 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 they don't all just decide to sit down because they're tired of playing the game. Mm -hmm. And I look at that 25% and I say, we've got a name for you cows. You're problem breeders, right? And I say, okay, let's do this exercise over again. Everybody stands up. You do that same thing. The same 25, 25 people are not standing up, yeah. at, the, at that third flip. It's, it's a real visual. If you, if you have the right size of a group and they're, they're willing to do that, if you don't lose total control of the room trying to run that exercise. But – the point is there is a lot of randomness to reproduction. I do a whole talk on, I call it the randomness of repro. And, and uh, it's adapted from a great book called The Drunkard's Walk, actually. Uh, uh, if, if I can remember the, the guy's Drunkard's name. The Drunkard's, <laughs> the Drunkard's Walk. I should, I should pull it up here on, uh, on, uh, on my deal here. That's a really great point. Where our group was asked, uh, okay, yeah, M M Matthias Tengaferro from our group uh, a few months ago was asked to deliver a talk on the problem breeder, uh, an international talk, and, and Matthias came to me yeah. and he said, uh, "What what do I talk about? Like, what what's a problem? <laughs> what? He says, just just call them. Don't. <laughs> what are we going to yeah. do to get them? Yeah, and I think that's a good point, right? I, I recall years. It ago is an early, old way to think. Yeah, you know, early days in practice, you would have that one cow that you would do everything to to try to get her pregnant, right? <laughs> yeah. This, this book, The Drunkard's Walk, How Randomness Rules Our Lives, is by a guy by the name of Leonard Mladenow. He's a, he's a mathematician. 
it's a great book. I highly recommend it. But it, but I was reading that book on an airplane, Mark, one of these 11 hour flights that you and I talk about. And um, I'm, I'm just reading this book and he's using examples and I'm going, this is how dairy cattle reproduction works. This is it. And so I adapted a lot of those examples just to dairy cattle reproduction. The veterinarians love the randomness of repro talk because because they get blamed, you know, why, why didn't I have, you know, we checked 10 cows and we only got two pregnant. We had six pregnant last week. What, what, what happened? You know, well, that's random. That's random variation, right? In 10 cows. And, and the fact of the matter is many of our farms preg check that that's when repro happens on a lot of farms at the preg check, right? Exactly. So you you do the preg check and it's easy math, right? Okay. We checked, we checked 10 cows and two got pregnant. That's a 20% conception rate this week. We're at crisis mode. And Mark, if you just look at a dairy management program and you run conception rate by week, okay, I don't care how big the dairy is. Well, I mean, you may work with dairies that have 10,000 cows. That that does make a difference. Even on a 3,000 cow dairy, there's up and down variation in that conception rate week to week. And it's not just a small amount. It's a large amount. And what I run into is is farmers try to manage week they, they think about weekly uh, preg checks like like a tank average you know like yes. milk production yeah. well milk production is a continuous variable stays fairly tight if there's a big swing in milk production something really bad happened you'll see 20 25 30 percent swings in week to week preg check outcomes on uh, even on a 3,000 cow dairy where they supposedly have enough cows that that randomness isn't there but it is and so it's another topic that I talk about this randomness of reproduction and you know how unfortunately when you have small farms um, they don't have a lot of observations and a a quick story Mark I was given a talk um, and and this this farmer said he said you know I have to trust the data that you're showing me because I don't have enough cows on my farm to do the experiment And that was one of the smartest things I've ever heard anybody in my talk say, because what is the what is the uh, the human uh, desire is to prove to yourself that something works. Right. And so they're going to go take a technology when OffSync was brand new. They'd go home and they'd try OffSync. You know, I had a, a lady at a talk I did. She said, you know, I hate to burst your bubble. But I tried OvSync and it doesn't work on my oh, cows. Doesn't, doesn't work on my cows. The whole audience, 200 people, just kind of, oh my, you know, this guy's telling us something that's not true. And so I have, you have to kind of deal with that situation. I said, okay, ma'am, what, what did you do? Well, I had, uh, you know, I had three cows and I just couldn't get them pregnant. And it was August. It was hot. It was summertime. And I bred those three cows to OvSync and only one got pregnant. You know, so that was her experiment, right? And that proved to her that OffSync doesn't work. Well, that's not the way. That's not the way you you approach you approach reproduction in any situation. So, anyhow, that that I I, I used that uh, example comment just last week. I <clears throat> had a great opportunity to uh, go back and visit some uh, friends, some previous veterinary externs um, from 2010 in Slovenia who are dairy practitioners. Um, so. You know, for those of you who take on interns in any way, externs, <clears throat> whether that's nutritionists, uh, dairy farms, what have you, you all know. But I, uh, a little plug for that mentoring because it's it's great the relationships you build. But had uh, you know, most of those farms are, are 20, 30, 50 cows. There's some that are a bit larger. But I just said, gee, to, you know, to have any meaningful repro outcome, you would want a minimum probably of 350 cows per group. Yep. So you would never be able to answer this question. So I said, you know, this is published in Journal of Dairy Science, like, you know, and you have Holstein cows, uh, yep, they're in Slovenia, but like, it's going to work, okay? Or yep. if it doesn't work, it's how you, you know, you didn't comply or or some other issue. So I think that's a really, um, yeah, really important concept is you don't need to try everything or you can't try everything. No, you can't. Yeah. Along the, the lines of randomness, randomness, Paul, um, you know, what we'll see is that, okay, is that randomness actually have some relationship to something that happened? I guess one thing that we'll see often is, you know, as we moved into years ago into um, ovarian structures, 
and and then a, a different protocol for those cows that you know don't have a CL at, at open diagnosis. Um, what I what we would see is weeks of you know zero to one two cows in a herd that would need a seeder, and then all of a sudden you have one week and gee we're putting 15, 20 seeders in, and you you say okay something happened, you know likely that wasn't random. It, it, it maybe appears random, but something happened. Who knows what? You know, was there a change in the in the starch level? Were there some mycotoxins? Were there, you know, beyond you know phase of the moon, right? But um, I guess some questions there are interesting as you say big data. Can you perhaps start to relate to? Yep, those were cows that came through transition and had uh, you know really high BHBs, and that was a problem in close up. And you know now those are the cows that that week that cohort of cows are getting bred, and yep they. They do have some some issue that uh, might appear random, but actually was due to some event. So you've asked a great question, right? How do you – and the question really, if I can rephrase it, there's inherent vari- vari- variability. There's inherent randomness in this binomial outcome. This Is she pregnant or is she not? How do you distinguish between the random randomness and a real change? Change, yes. That's, that's, that's a great question. Right. My answer to that is it's very difficult to do. Okay. And this is a really important concept. Analyzing herd data is, you know, it's great that we use data. We always want to make decisions based on data. But that's a very different situation than running a randomized controlled experiment where you control the the variable that you want to you want to do what we're showing in a randomized controlled experiment a well-designed one we are ascribing the difference in treatments due to whatever change that we made right so your question you know plus or minus cl we did that right i mean we we knew if you if you randomize cows that have that don't have a cl and you put a cedar in them or you don't you know you can see improvements in fertility that's how we do those kinds of things um, the problem is farms don't normally do randomized controlled experiments. And when you look at variation, so let me give you, go back to my example. I had a, a veterinarian that emailed me a, the, the chart that I just talked about. So it's a chart, weekly conception rate. It says what we're dealing with on this farm is variation week to week in conception rate. And I looked at that and I said, this is as human beings. Our brains are pattern seeking. We try to uh, ascribe changes to something. We, we try to explain the world around us, right? But inherent in that is normalcy bias, all these kinds of biases, right? And so what they were doing was they'd say, okay, this week we had a 60% conception rate at herd check, and next week we had 40. So who was breeding the cows that week? Who yeah. was given all the treatments? Who was doing this? Who was doing there? So their their pattern seeking brains are trying to figure are trying to explain that variation. And I told them, you will drive yourself to utter madness yes, yes. trying to explain random variation. Okay. So back to your question, there are such things as process control. So if you there are there are statistical ways to look at large amounts of data. Again, you have to have lots of cows. That will say this this three week trend or four week trend is actually a statistical trend down or a statistical trend up. That's where I say, okay, now maybe we can try to find some. Maybe it's a change in the season. Again, when you're not running randomized controlled trials, it can be anything. It could be the phase of the moon. It could be it could be whatever. So it's really hard. And a lot of farms that are trying to improve repro, they change ten things. Right. Oh, let's change this and this and this and this and this. And then all of a sudden repro gets better. And it's like, well, it was that. Right. Well, how do you know it was that? It could have been the other thing that you changed. Right. So this this is the nature of working with these problems on dairies. Um, but your question's a really good one. It's probably the most popular question I get when I talk about the randomness of repro. How do you distinguish real problems from just random variation? And I think yeah. you have to look at long. So you've looked at these graphs. Right. So. 
go to uh, a heat stress area of the country and look at weekly conception, you can see the dips in heat stress. I mean, it's just they're big and they're deep and you just go, well, that's that's heat stress. That's what that is, right? But those are long-term trends that you see across time in a, in a lot of cows. So it's frustrating. Repro is frustrating. It's also exciting. I, you know, it, yeah. it's certainly frustrating, but it's one of those areas that you can, you can have um, impact. Uh, and, and I think the other thing that, again, I, I, we get to all the time, and, and you, obviously you, you preach this lots, is, is just that compliance, right? Again, yep. don't forget the compliance to a program. Uh, if, if your herd doesn't have the management to um, get all the injections in properly and, and, and good management there, your success is going to be a lot lower than, than those herds that can. So don't, don't forget that, I guess, is sometimes what we see. It's yeah, like, compliance was something that uh, early on with these protocols was a big deal. I think people, I, I was dealing with people who would say, let's say you have a protocol like a precinct obstinate program with five treatments. They were telling me, oh, we're we're uh, 95% compliant. And I said, what do you that mean by that? Fly. Well, <laughs> right. Well, but on the days, uh, what they meant was each day that we catch cows, we get 95% of them on the list. And this is a big farm. And they said, hey, that how much better do you want to speak? But that's not, not 95% compliant. If the cows that you miss are random each week, it's yeah, 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95. Times 0.95. 0.95. Yeah. You're down, you, actually, <laughs> cows that complete the protocol correctly under that situation are uh, you're down in the 60% range. You're not 95% compliant. You're like 60% compliant. So, Mark, I started to harp on that a lot. Um, I, I did a talk many years ago com called Compliance is Key. And you're exactly right. What I find is that the farms that do well with these protocols have figured that out. And, you know, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, one, of the, one of the groups, one of the dairy groups up here in Wisconsin, they, uh, they have gone to a pneumatic uh, system that delivers generation prostaglandin. It's called yes. the Pulse system. Mm -hmm. And what they, so it's kind of an interesting story. What, what, uh, what the herdsman did is he put pedometers on his employees they were responsible for going out on this 5,000 cow dairy, finding cows and getting them locked down and giving them the right stuff. Well, these, these guys are walking 8, 10 miles a day to get that job done. So what they did is they built a platform on the rotary. They've got parlor boss. they got the big screen up there. So every cow on the rotary, you can see her, you know, where she is and what she needs. And as these cows come by, they've got the pneumatic guns there. And they do the treatments right there. Well, guess what, Mark? Every cow goes through the parlor. Yes. So hopefully you find her. <laughs> well, I mean, unless she's not being milked, you're going to find her. Because one of the biggest problems with compliance that, that we, you know, we did experiments on farms. What do you do if a cow, we would run lists of cows that you need by pen, right? So what if the cow, let's say you're in pen one. What if a cow that you need in pen one is in pen two? And that's common. You, you'll never find her. Oh, Because she could be in pen three. She could be in pen four. She, what are you going to do? Go back through all the pens and look for, for that particular cow. And so by, by putting the uh, treatments in the parlor, and I used to kind of hate the, that idea with the parlor, but with this pulse system, it's not like putting a needle into a cow. It's just, a, it's, it's just air, air using to, to inject it into the muscle. Um, they've really solved that compliance problem. So it's pretty interesting. It gets away from the needles, uh, which is a good thing to do. And it's a pretty cool system they have set up. I, th I think it's a really forward looking, uh, way to implement technology to get this particular job done on the dairy. Yeah, that's a great example, Paul. Of, yeah. Anything you can do to, um, obviously, uh, improve compliance, but then in the same token, their lockup times, right? Now those cows yep. can go back to their pen and not have to be locked up. Um, we know in a lot of herds that some, some of the efficiencies of lockup uh, time you know, aren't great. And how does that negatively, negatively affect reproduction, especially in heat stress, milk production, what have you. So I think yep. all of these technologies as we, uh, you know, let the cow be a cow and, and, and let's not mess with her if we don't need to, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. Adiseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine Hem, the best-in-class rumen-protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, capture more value from their components, and maintain their lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to MilkPay.com. It's time for our famous three. Your partner in improving animal performance, Berg and Schmidt. They provide high quality economical feed ingredients for ruminants, like their well-researched coated nutrients and fat powders that can support cows with additional available energy, which improves their overall health, productive performance, and your cost efficiency. So Paul, uh, uh, excellent discussion. Um, uh, really great to have you uh, here this morning uh, for, for this uh, talk on the high fertility cycle. Um, I know our uh, listeners will look forward to uh, uh, a follow-up again as, as we get more data and so forth, very practical, um, and, and look towards you know that paradigm shift of uh, toss out those old body condition scoring charts or the, or the recommendations, use the charts, the scoring is still accurate, it's, uh, it's what we use as our metrics. Um, I think you already uh, as, uh, answered one of the wrap-up questions. I think the, the uh, drunkard's walk. So I might say uh, Good book. A, a, yeah, a, non, a non-dairy reference that you, know, you, you have read or, or that, that can be, in this case, related. And I, I, like, uh, I, I love to take those type uh, books, uh, either uh, you know, sometimes they're team building or self-help, what have you. But I think The Goal uh, by Allahu Goldrat is another example. It's, uh, it's all about uh, production in a factory, but really finding the bottleneck, right? And I think you can look at that in Repro too. All these milk quality production, reproduction is all multifactorial, um, but your protocol is not going to matter if you have fat cows, for example, right? So um, I think that, that those are, that's one of my books to uh, to put on the list. Um, but as you, uh, what, what's a, for the, uh, the audience, a reference uh, that you go to uh, for dairy stuff, you know, online, a book, a, a journal, what have you. Yeah. So I'm kind of a dairy junkie, right? So I, I read a lot of lay press stuff just to keep up on the trends that are out in the industry, but it, keeping up on the science, uh, is keeping up with the journals, you know, journal dairy science, uh, thorough genealogy. Um, one of the cool things that I've done is, uh, you know, Google rules our lives now, but you can actually put word searches into Google and it will aggregate uh, any word or series of words that you want. So anything that's on anything that's out there in the world that's on dairy reproduction, mm -hmm. dairy cattle reproduction comes across my my blog feed. Mm -hmm. And so I can keep up with stuff that way and I can filter through the scientific stuff. Uh, from the lay press kind of stuff, but but you know it's just to keep your eyeballs on what's happening out there and and it's uh, there's you know the thing is Mark there's so much information being generated now the volume of scientific papers that are coming out just even in a in a fairly narrow area like dairy cattle reproduction is just there's a lot 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 to keep up on. No, exactly. I, I, I the the last uh, email from uh, you know Journal Dairy Science. Uh, as I was scrolling down and, and clicking on the ones I wanted to read, I was actually frustrated that there were too many. Like, when am I yep. going to have time to read all these? You know, so, some issues, you know, I'm clicking on two or three or one. And I, there's, I think I opened 15 tabs to, <laughs> that's great. And that's just one industry. journal. That's just one that's journal. One, one journal, one month. So I said, that's great. But now I got to, I got to find the time to read all those. Um, uh, and then uh, you've already given lots of examples, but you know, as you work with producers all over the world, you know, what sets apart that, that progressive producer that is, you know, running their, uh, running their dairy like a business? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mark. What, what I would say is that the best of the best have uh, a unique mindset. Um, and the mindset is they do all the little things right. But I think the way that they do that is they bring to the table the expertise that they need, right? So they're going to bring in nutrition expertise, repro expertise, genetic expertise, 
And when they gather around the table, uh, they're not arguing or fighting or blaming. Uh, they're, they're a team that's working together to try to get better. And so these dairies are never, uh, never happy with where they are. They always want to improve. I, I worked with a, a dairy group one time and they, uh, they looked at me and said, uh, whatever you do, don't tell us everything is okay. We don't want advisors that say everything is okay. We want advisors that are going to push us to the next level. That's a mindset. And, and those are, those are people you want to work with. And frankly, they're hard to stay ahead of because they're, they're right on the edge. They, they adopt technology quickly. And so, um, it, it's a fun group to work with, but I would say Mark, it's the mindset. It's the mindset and how they use expertise and experience around them. Um, that's great. I, I, I'll have to say this is definitely a stolen quote from Andy Johnson. Um, but, uh, if I don't piss off my clients now and again, I'm not doing my job. And, and, and I right. love that. That's another and way to say I, it. I, yeah. Another way to and say I think it. Andy's very good at doing that, but in a, in a very prog progressive way, right? Like I, I'm pushing you because I know you can do better. I know you can do this. Um, and then another from, from Joe Kloffenstein, a good friend is, you know, when you're ready to go to the next level, I'm, I'm, I'm here to help you. So like, yep. okay, I'm not, I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to push you anymore, but remember I'm here. And, and when you, yep. when you're ready to do that, make that change, per, perhaps I could help. So, and those uh, two comments are, those two comments are kind of, as I view those, those are trying to take not the best, but trying to pull those people up, right? The best yes. people you don't have to push the best people make you push them. Right. But, but just the general client base that you're working with trying to get those people into that mindset. I think that those two quotes are excellent to, to, to think about. Excellent. So again, Paul, a uh, 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 sincere pleasure. Um, look forward to seeing you soon here, DCRC. Put in a little push for the Dairy Cattle Reproductive Council you meeting. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of that, that conference, uh, it's a great mix of uh, dairy producers, veterinarians, industry folks, and academics all in the same room. Lots of practical stuff. I, I really enjoy that meeting because it's it's not all academics, it's not all vets, it's not all dairy producers, but a really cool mix of, of folks that come together. Um, I know Dr. Fricky is very involved in that, as, as many others are, and uh, you know, a, a little push, check that out uh, online uh, to, for the registration. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome, you're welcome. You have a great uh, day, and again, thanks for your participation. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining the Dairy Podcast Show, and uh, we'll uh, see you again soon.